Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another Breakfast Club. Um, you picked a really good one to tune into because today we are welcoming the Academy's curator of herpetology, Dr. Rena Bell. Hi, Rena. Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Um, so I actually remember the first time I heard the word herpetologist, and it was in third grade when this kid stood up and announced that that's what he was going to be. And I was like, okay, that's clearly a made up word. Good luck with that. I'm a practical person, so I'm gonna be a real word, which is an astronaut. Uh, but somehow you made this work for you. So will you start by telling us um, how, what a herpetologist is and how you found your way there? Yeah, um, so herpetology, I didn't hear the word herpetology until college. So you were ahead of me there. Um, but herpetology is the study of amphibians and reptiles. And I actually have a couple of slides to show um, sort of how I first discovered herpetology and ended up where I am now at the academy. But I will share a kind of awkward story, which is that in the herpetology course that I took in college, someone had enrolled in the class without knowing what it was about. And they thought that herpetology was the study of herpes viruses. They were a yep. pre-medical student. <laughs> And so her first day of class, she was so confused about yeah. what was going on. And she actually stuck with the class for a couple of weeks, but she did end up dropping it in the end because it was not what she signed up for. So. That's funny. The, first, <laughs> like, the second time I heard the word herpetologist, I also thought it had something to do with herpes. And I was like, that's slightly distasteful, but OK. Sounds like, you know, a well-paying science job. Yeah. <laughs> might be better paying than herpetology, but yeah, <laughs> than real herpetology. Well, I actually li love the fact that you're approaching today's talk as kind of a 101, because I think like herps are a really big group and a lot of people probably do have questions about them that never actually got answered in school or in life, and maybe even have some like fear or discomfort around some of those animals. Um, actually, can we bust a myth? Do you, have you ever been remote, like even a little grossed out by something you found in a pond or swamp somewhere? Um, yeah, so, and that's another thing that I will also share is like a couple kind okay. of classic things, but um, it's fine, there are no spoilers. <laughs> but yeah, there are some herps that initially when you see them, they're just like really different looking than what we're used to seeing because we don't have a lot of experience with a lot of the different species, especially ones that occur in more tropical environments. Those mm -hmm. of us who live in temperate areas don't necessarily come across them. Um, and so when you first uh, see a herp, your initial impression might be like, whoa, what is that thing? Yeah. It's like an alien. I've never seen anything like this before. But what I find uh, to be really rewarding is once you actually learn more about these species and why they look the way they do, they're not as unsettling. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true for a lot of organisms. Like some people are afraid of things that you know you wouldn't necessarily think could be scary to somebody, but then once they learn a little bit more about their biology and their behaviors, they can become more interesting and more approachable. Totally, and I think also a lot of, like, it's kind of unfair, a lot of herps are just inherently very moist, and I think humans are afraid of moist things because it signals like underground or caves or hidden or something like that. So I think it triggers, I have a whole theory on this, we can go into it later, but okay. anyway. I was gonna, some people don't even like that word that you just used. Moist? Oh, I know. Oh, God, sorry. This so, is where we also like, um, put up a slide that shows like holes and things, and then we'll just get everybody freaked out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for sure, people tend to think of herps as being like clammy, slimy, like cold, um, and even touching them can kind of freak them out or gross them out. But all right, but you're by the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna all of it. <laughs> okay, well, cool. People who are watching right now, if you have questions at any point during um, Raina's talk, you can just leave them in the comment section, whether you're right or watching on Facebook or YouTube, and we'll loop back at the end and ask as many as we can. Um, and I'll get out of here um, and hand it over to Raina for her pathology 101, the spectacular diversity of amphibians and reptiles. Thank you so much, Raina. Yeah. Okay. So welcome to Herpetology 101. We're going to try to cover the basics of herpetology in a short amount of time um, so that you have a better working knowledge of this very cool group of animals. So as I very briefly mentioned to Laurel just now, despite what all these pictures would suggest of me holding all different kinds of amphibians and reptiles, I didn't actually grow up obsessed with them. 
um, like some kids do announce in their third grade classes that they're going to be herpetologists when they grow up. I didn't learn that word until college. Um, and so I was very fortunate to just by chance enroll in a herpetology class uh, when I was an undergraduate student at UC Berkeley. And it was a really interesting subject area, of course. Um, but it was also one of the first times for me in college where the professor was really emphasizing all the things that we didn't know about the subject area rather than memorizing a bunch of facts from the book. So of course, he did cover a lot of basics, some of the things I'll be sharing with you today. But he also kept emphasizing all that we still have to discover about amphibians and reptiles. So for instance, in one lecture, he noted that over 100 new species of frogs were being described every year. And by described, I mean uh, documented and written up in scientific journals as being distinct species. And when a new species is described, we often know very little about their bi basic biology, um, like where they reproduce, what they eat, any of their behaviors. And because we don't know those things about their basic biology, we also tend to not know anything about their conservation status. So whether they're declining or threatened with extinction. And so this was the first time for me in college that I realized how much we still have to learn about our planet. And even about these really conspicuous and charismatic animals, some of which are in our backyards. And so after that herpetology course, uh, and I also got involved in biology research as a student at Berkeley, I then decided to go to graduate school where I started doing research on the evolution, ecology, and conservation of African frogs. Um, and so this is a picture of me doing field work on Sao Tome Island, which is off the coast of West Central Africa. And I'm working at night because I'm searching for frogs. And so now I'm very fortunate to be part of the team at the California Academy of Sciences in the Department of Herpetology, where we curate and do research on one of the world's most significant collections of amphibians and reptiles. And so this is me with my teammates, Erica and Lauren. So there are over 8,100 described species of amphibians uh, at the moment and more than 11,000 described species of reptiles, and that's excluding birds, which technically are reptiles, um, but I'll get to that in a second. And so this morning, I really only have time to cover some of the basics about these two groups of animals that herpetologists study. And so I'm gonna share some of their extreme adaptations for survival, some of their courtship behaviors, and other interesting things about their biology. So first, how do amphibians and reptiles fit into the tree of life? And here, obviously, this is a very zoomed in uh, part of the tree of life. We're just looking at vertebrate animals. So those are animals like fishes and other animals that have backbones. And then if we zoom in a little bit further, so here the branches are basically like a family tree where animals or species that are uh, further down in the tree and share uh, branches are more closely related to each other than animals that are further down the tree with branches that are more distant. So here, this group that includes amphibians, mammals, lizards, snakes, turtles, crocs, dinosaurs, birds, so basically all vertebrates except for the fishes are called the tetrapods. And those are the vertebrates that have four legs, or at least their ancestors had four legs. Some of them don't have four legs today. Then if we zoom in a little bit further, we have the amniotes. And so this is tetrapods, but excluding the amphibians. And these are animals that have the amniotic egg. And then if we zoom in a little bit further, now excluding mammals, which of course are studied by mammologists, um, then we have the reptiles. And so reptiles includes lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodilians, dinosaurs, and birds. Um, but as I mentioned, herpetology doesn't really include the study of birds. Those are studied by ornithologists. So we won't be talking about them today. But if you're looking at this, very zoomed in tree and thinking, well, how did herpetology come to be a field of study if it 
is kind of this grab bag of tetrapods, but not including some of the amniotes because we're excluding mammals and birds and for the most part excluding dinosaurs. And the reason for this is historical. And so this dates back to when biologists were first coming up with a classification system for all living things. And this was way before Darwin. And so evolution and evolutionary relationships weren't really part of the classification system the way that they are today. And instead, biologists were organizing living things into categories based on similarities and how different plants and animals looked, where they lived, and other aspects of their lifestyles. And so amphibians and reptiles got lumped together as the non-bird, non-mammal vertebrates that were these kind of slimy, creepy, crawly creatures. And that's also how they got their name, which is not the most appealing sounding name. Um, okay, so now we're going to dive in to some of the diversity of these two groups, and we're going to start with amphibians. So amphibians have been around for about 370 million years. And at this point in time, uh, there are about 7,200 species of frogs and toads that are described, 740 species of salamanders and newts, and just over 200 species of Sicilians. And just like my professor uh, indicated in my college class, none of that has changed. New species are being described all the time, and that rate hasn't slowed down since I was uh, taking my herpetology class about 15 years ago. Uh, and so there are about 100 or so new species described every year. These numbers should be correct. I just checked them a couple of days ago. Um, but if you're very curious and keeping up with this sort of thing, amphibiaweb.org is a great resource. Uh, it's a website that collates all the latest uh, species numbers for amphibians and also has really nice natural history information about different species if you want to learn more about any of the species I talk about today. So we actually are going to have a very brief quiz, um, and that is, if you can tell the difference between a frog and a toad, and here we have two photos, and I'll give you the answer in a second, but do you think that the species on the left, A, is the frog or the toad, or the species on the right, B? So if you're stumbling a little, I'm sure you're not alone. Um, frog and toad are common words that we use all the time in the English language, um, but they are a little bit confusing to apply in a biological framework. Um, and that's because, again, dating back to earlier times when biologists were describing amphibian diversity, toad was used to describe species that have bumpy skin and are more terrestrial. Um, and then frog was used to describe the other kinds of frogs, which have smooth skin and tend to be more aquatic. So the answer here is actually that the species on the left in a biological context is technically a toad and the species on the right is technically not a toad. Um, and I'll explain why in a second. But there are lots and lots of frog species that have toad in the common name. Um, and again, that's because toad is being used to describe their appearance, but it's not necessarily biologically correct to call them toads. So here are just a couple of examples. Um, in the upper left, we have the European and North American spadefoot toads. And so these have sort of a toady appearance. They're terrestrial, they have bumpy skin. Um, the really adorable orange species next to those is a Brazilian species called uh, pumpkin toadlet. Uh, and it's very, very small and terrestrial and brightly colored and has slightly bumpy skin. The species next to that with all those white things on its back end are called midwife toads. And those white things are actually a clutch of eggs that the males of this species carry on their backsides to keep them safe. 
Um, then if we go back again to the other side, to the left, we have the helmeted water toad. So that's that really big green species. As you can see, it also has bumpy skin. Next to that is the fire-bellied toad. And then below that are some burrowing species that are also called toad in their common name. Um, and then I'm holding a lizard whose common name is horny toad. Um, but of course, it's not a frog or a toad at all. It's a lizard. Um, and then I have a brief warning for people who are afraid of uh, holes and lots of holes next to each other. Avert your eyes for a moment. I'll tell you when it's safe to look again. Um, but this species that I'm about to show you is the um, sorry, is the Suriname toad. And so that's the adult there with its jazz hands spread out. Okay, and the warning starts now. Um, and this species is somewhat famous because of its very interesting reproductive behavior where the eggs are deposited into the female's backside and um, they will develop underneath her skin. And when the little froglets are ready to emerge, they hatch out through holes in her skin. And this really creeps some people out. Okay, so those are all examples of things that have toad in the name, but are technically not toads as far as biologists are concerned, or herpetologists are concerned. So true toads are just found in one family of frogs called the Buffonidae. And these uh, frogs, or these toads, are characterized by having no teeth on their jaws. They also have this special gland right behind the eye, uh, which there's an arrow pointing to there called the paratoid gland. And this is their poison gland that secretes a toxic uh, sort of mucousy liquid when they are trying to defend themselves. And they also have this organ called the bitters organ, which is an endocrine or hormone gland that's next to the kidney. So a lot of toads have rough skin uh, and a lot of them are terrestrial, but as you saw in the quiz, there are some exceptions to that, but they do share these other traits. So these are all some examples of true toads in the family Buffonidae. So this is in the upper left, that species that I had showed you. This is an arboreal species, so a species that spends a lot of time up on bushes and um, up in the canopy. And you can see that it has webbing in between its fingers to help it grip um, and be a better climber. They're also really small, they're about this big. Um, and then there are some examples of more sort of typical looking toads that you might be used to, but there are also some really beautifully colored ones like this arboreal toad that's also quite large um, on the upper right side. And then in the middle here, this is an Adelopus toad, uh, which is a chemically defended and very brightly colored to advertise how toxic it is to potential predators. So within toads, we do have quite a bit of diversity, um, but this is just one of the more than 50 families of frogs. And there are thousands of other species of frogs that are not toads. So all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Okay, so here's just a sampling of some of that diversity. We have tree frogs, glass frogs, dart frogs, rain frogs, tailed frogs, um, frogs that are spending time in the water, frogs that are burrowing, um, and frogs that are trying to blend into the leaf litter, like the species in the lower left, and species that are advertising how toxic they are, and uh, like this dart frog on the upper left. So a huge diversity of different frogs and their body types and colorations are often reflecting the habitats that they live in and the lifestyles that they have. And so these are adaptations to their environments. And one of the things that's been pretty surprising, um, but also can make the study of frogs a little bit challenging when you first get started, is that sometimes species in different families will look really similar because they've adapted to a similar lifestyle or habitat, which we call convergent evolution, but they're actually not closely related at all. So from an evolutionary perspective, this is a super interesting thing to study, but when you're taking a class and trying to learn all the different kinds of frogs just by looking at them, it can be a little bit frustrating at first um, because sometimes things 
look almost identical, but they actually occur on opposite ends of the world and are separated by hundreds of millions of years of evolution. So you probably already know that most species of frogs lay eggs in water and those eggs will hatch into tadpoles, those tadpoles will undergo metamorphosis, and then those tadpoles um, after metamorphosing usually are terrestrial and they're mini versions of adult frogs. But there are a lot of exceptions to this and documenting all these variations to this general rule and how they've evolved is a major area of research in amphibian biology. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of the interesting um, exceptions to this rule. So the first are making these protective nests for the eggs to develop in. So on the left here, we have a species of foam nesting frog. Um, these are frogs found in Central Africa. And the males and females will sort of beat this um, kind of like egg white like secretion and they'll turn it into a meringue that sort of envelops the eggs. You can see it here. Um, and then there are other species like this South American uh, frog that makes this sort of volcano mud nest and the eggs are inside of there and they'll develop safely um, and also stay more uh, humid in this little mud nest environment that he's created. Some species will carry their developing young around on their backs. So on the left here, we have a male dart frog who's carrying the tadpoles on his back so that he can move them into individual little pools of water that are formed in plants called bromeliads. And this is where the tadpoles will complete their development, but he's spreading his tadpoles out into multiple bromeliads so they each get their own little bathtub nursery. Um, and then on the right, we have a female marsupial frog, and she has these specialized pouches on her back to store the fertilized developing eggs, and they will go undergo their full development in this protective pouch, and fully formed baby frogs will eventually emerge. So these frogs might not look very remarkable, but they have some of the most unique reproductive strategies among frogs. So this species on the left is the Nimba toad. And after a nine months gestation, the female will give birth to fully formed froglets. So um, just like many mammals, all the development is taking place inside of the female and she also provides nutrition to them internally. And then this species on the right is a recently discovered species from Indonesia where the female gives birth to live tadpoles. So they still have a tadpole life stage, but the development from egg into tadpole happens within the female. Um, and this was only discovered a few years ago, incidentally by my herpetology instructor at UC Berkeley, um, Professor Jim McGuire. And then finally, some species of frogs still lay eggs, but the eggs skip the tadpole development stage. And this is called direct development. So these are two distantly related species of frog. The species on the left uh, is a species endemic to Puerto Rico and they lay their eggs on land. And as you can see, the developing embryos are visible in those, uh, each of those little eggs. And a miniature version of the adult frog is going to hatch out of those eggs. And then on the right, we have uh, a narrow mouthed frog from Australia, and it's very distantly related to this Puerto Rican species, and it also has direct development where miniature versions of the adult frog are going to hatch out of that cluster of eggs. And so this reproductive strategy has evolved several times in frogs, but it seems to be restricted to tropical frogs, presumably because uh, you need a humid environment so that the eggs don't dry out. Okay, so I could talk about frogs for hours, but we have a lot to cover. So we're gonna move on to our next group of amphibians. So just like toad and frog, you might've heard the term salamander and newt used interchangeably and maybe not known for sure what the difference is. And um, it's kind of like toad. So newt refers to 
a specific kind of salamander. And specifically, it's salamanders in the family or subfamily Plurodelini. And salamanders in this subfamily have this unique life history where they have as adults a terrestrial phase and then they go back to water to breed uh, every year. And when they go back for this breeding season, they actually have some pretty significant changes to their body plans to be better at moving around in water. So if you look closely at the tails of the terrestrial phase versus the aquatic phase um, of this newt, you can see that the aquatic phase has more of a fin-like tail, it's broader, um, and there are some other variations that they also exhibit, but that's the most obvious one to see. Uh, and so many newts are also um, toxic, and so they often will have bright coloration to advertise, advertise this toxicity to potential predators. So all newts are salamanders, but not all newts or sorry, not all salamanders are newts. So one of the things that really blew me away when I took herpetology was learning that North America is actually the hotspot for salamander diversity. So for lots of groups of plants and animals, you might think that you have to travel somewhere really exotic to see a lot of diversity. But uh, for people who are salamander enthusiasts, the United States is the place to go for that, or North America more broadly. So this map is actually showing the diversity of amphibian species, um, so including frogs, but most of this diversity is actually driven by salamander diversity, not frog diversity. So overall, salamanders have about a tenth as many species globally as frogs, but in North America, you can see over 200 of the 740 species that have been described and nine of the 10 families occur in the lower 48. And so I'm just gonna tell you a couple of stories about some of the fascinating species that are right in our backyards here in North America. So the first is the Mount Lyell salamander, which is from the Sierra Nevada of California. And this species is part of the family Plethodonidae, which is notable for not having any lungs. So they breathe entirely through their skin. And you might not think of salamanders as being particularly fast moving if you've seen them. Um, they generally aren't, but that doesn't mean that they aren't capable of rapid movements. So to capture its prey, the Mount Lyle salamander can project its tongue nearly as far as its body length. And in part, this is because it doesn't have lungs. So it's been able to modify the musculature where the lungs would be to be able to do this. Um, and they, so they can project their tongue out really far, but they can also do it really rapidly. So this is a high-speed video that's going to demonstrate how, oops, how they do this to catch their prey. So pretty cool. Maybe you've seen this in uh, chameleons, which of course are very famous for being able to shoot their tongues out, but now you can tell people that salamanders can do it too. Okay, so down in this southeast corner of the United States, which as you can see, has really exceptional diversity of salamanders. Um, I'm just gonna tell you about one group that are pretty uh, unusual. And if you don't live in the southeast or you haven't gotten salamander searching there, you probably haven't come across these, but these are the amphiumas. And so these are actually quite large uh, eel-like salamanders. They're completely aquatic. They have really tiny arms. I'm just pointing at them here with these arrows. Um, and they have um, a really long lifespan, so they can live over 25 years, it's estimated, and they can also go several years without eating. Uh, and I could go on also for hours talking about salamanders, but we need to keep moving. So let's move on to the third type of amphibian, which are the Sicilians. So if you've never heard of Sicilians until today, I'm sure you're not alone. Um, at first glance, these might look like a worm or a snake, but they have backbones, so they're vertebrates. And even though none of them have legs, they're descended from that tetrapod ancestor that had four legs. There are only a couple hundred known species 
And because they have pretty secretive lifestyles, as you can see, they like to burrow underground, there's still a lot of basic information about their biology that we don't know yet. One of the better known species occurs on Sao Tome Island, which is that island that I showed you um, a photo of me doing field work there. So I've actually been lucky enough to see some of these. And the species there is really brightly colored and it's very abundant. So everyone on Sao Tome knows them very well. Um, and this is a photo from a research trip that I was on in 2015, where we caught a female Sicilian and overnight she gave birth to these two babies. Um, which that was known about their their biology. But what was really surprising to me was how big those babies are relative to the mother's size. Um, she had both of those inside of her just hours before we took this photo. So it's a, a massive reproductive investment um, that they're making to care for their young. Okay, so now we're gonna transition to the other half of her pathology, the reptiles. And as I mentioned, Birds don't really fit into her pathology, um, but I'm also not gonna talk about dinosaurs today. So just like with amphibians, actually, new species of reptiles are being described to science on a regular basis, um, also on the order of over 100 species per year. And the reptiledatabase.org is a great website for keeping up to date on these numbers if you're curious to learn more. Um, so these numbers also should be somewhat up to date, although I think they don't update their database quite as often as Amphibia Web does. Um, so reptiles have been around for about 13, sorry, 315 million years. And uh, we're gonna start with the most diverse group of reptiles, which are the Lepidosaurs. So those include tuataras, snakes, lizards, and amphisbenians. And there are over 10,000 species of these described. Um, but before we dive in to the lepidosaurs, one important misconception that's worth clearing up about reptiles and to some degree amphibians is this term cold-blooded. So despite being called cold-blooded, reptiles are actually capable of maintaining very warm body temperatures, but they do this by basking in the sun to warm up their bodies. And so this is a great clip of marine iguanas from the BBC's Life and Cold Blood series, where they uh, use thermal imaging to show you just how warm these marine iguanas can get. So here, orange is warm and purple is colder. And so you can see the iguana started out cooler or first thing in the morning, but then after sitting in the sun for about 30 minutes and basking on the rocks, their bodies warm up to the point where they're even warmer than their surroundings. And then here we have, of course, a wonderful human, um, David Attenborough, for comparison. And we can see that the marine iguana's blood is actually warmer than the warm-blooded David Attenborough. And so uh, being able to warm up their body temperature, of course, is very important because marine iguanas forage in, or they go search for food in really cold ocean water. And so they actually go back and forth from the cold ocean to basking on the rocks to maintain high enough body temperatures for this activity. Okay, so now that we've cleared up this cold-blooded misconception, um, onto another perhaps confusing uh, um, reptile situation, which is the tuataras. So the tuataras, they look like lizards, and maybe you think they even look quite similar to the marine iguanas that I just showed you. Um, and they are very closely related to lizards, but technically they are not lizards. So they are the closest living relatives of lizards and they're in their own group called the Rhynchocephalia. They're the last living representatives of this group. And this group, Rhynchocephalia, peaked uh, in the Jurassic and Triassic and they were much more diverse and incurred in many different habitats around the world. But today uh, they only have this last living representative, the Tuatara, and they only occur in New Zealand. So they're sort of like the last vestiges of um, a, a former empire. <laughs> uh, so they're super interesting animals. They have this light sensitive third eye on top of their head. Um, and it's not entirely known what they use it for, but it might be related to sensing seasonal differences in light levels. 
Um, and they're also super long lived. They can live over a hundred years. But the main takeaway about Chihuahuas, other than how cool they are, is that they look like lizards, but they're not technically lizards. Okay, so the rest of the Lepidosaurs are the squamates. And so this is where most of the current living diversity occurs. So this includes the lizards, the snakes, and the amphisbenians. So many of the species in this group don't have limbs, but it's not just the snakes that are limbless. So lots of different um, families of lepidosaurs have lost their limbs or have much reduced limbs, and it's evolved independently many different times. So amphisbenians, in case you've been wondering what those are, um, their common name is the worm lizards, and they're kind of like the Sicilians of the reptile world. So they burrow, they don't have external ears, they barely have eyes, and um, there's a lot that we still don't know about them. Most species don't have limbs, um, but this species on the right, the bipes, does have very well-developed forelimbs, but it's missing hind limbs. So it's kind of like a, a mermaid, <laughs> a terrestrial mermaid. Um, and because these species are burrowers, they lack limbs and they also have very thick skulls. Um, so from a morphology perspective or a skeletal morph or perspective, um, they can be pretty easily distinguished from other limbless lizards and from snakes. Okay, but what about the other limbless squamates? So how can you tell the difference between a snake and a limbless lizard? Well, one of the easiest ways to spot the difference is to look for the presence or absence of an ear opening. So if you look closely on the photo on the left, that is a limbless lizard, and you can see that it has a visible ear opening. And that's true for most, but not all, lizards. Um, but then if you look at the snake, you can see that there's clearly no visible ear opening. If you want a little bit more confirmation of what you're looking at, a limbless lizard or a snake, there are a few other features that might be able to help you. So um, those include looking at the scales on the underside of the body. So most snakes have specialized ventral scales or belly scales that are uh, wider than the scales that cover the rest of their bodies. So you can look for those. And then lizards also usually have movable eyelids while snakes do not. And snakes also typically have more mobile jaws or jaws that can open much wider to swallow large prey. And lizards typically do not. So they're usually restricted to just eating smaller prey. So even though snakes are famous for eating really large prey, not all snakes do. And so this is a really interesting species of sea snake. Uh, called the turtle-headed sea snake from the Australia region. And it's a species in the highly venomous elapid family, which includes things like mambas and coral snakes and cobras. But this species is very unique in that it exclusively eats fish eggs. Um, so a very different diet than most of its close relatives. And speaking of venomous snakes, I mentioned earlier today that toads and some other frogs are poisonous. And you might have heard that you're not supposed to use the term poisonous for snakes and that instead they're venomous. Um, so in case you've been confused about what that distinction is, the difference between poison and venom, regardless of whether we're talking about herpetology or other, uh, other animals, is that for poison to be affected, um, it has to be eaten or ingested by the potential predator to have an effect. So Poisonous animals often will have poison glands in their skin that are secreting uh, toxins and so that when a predator puts the animal in its mouth, it gets a taste of that poison and hopefully spits the animal out. Or if the animal is really brightly colored, it, the predator just learns to not eat really brightly colored things. Venom, on the other hand, has to be injected into the potential predator or prey item to be effective. Um, and so Lots of animals that are venomous have specialized structures to inject that venom into the predator or into the prey. Uh, and so 
That general rule usually works um, for describing animals as poisonous or venomous if you're talking about um, herpetology. But of course, there are some exceptions. So there are some species of keelback snakes, uh, which is the genus Rhabdophis, that are venomous, but they also have special glands in their necks where they store the poison that they get from eating poisonous toads, and they use that as defense themselves. So they're actually poisonous because they've stolen the poison from the toads, and they're also venomous. Um, and presumably they use this poison to protect themselves from their potential predators. So some lizards, that non-snake lizards, um, are venomous, and that includes the beaded lizards in North America. So the scientific name for these lizards is really cool. It's heloderma, which means sun skin. Um, and you can see by looking at their really beautiful color patterns that it's a very appropriate name. And these lizards have venom, but they use it for defense rather than for immobilizing their prey. Um, and speaking of defenses, Lizards have some pretty amazing adaptations for distracting or escaping from their predators, and I'm gonna share a couple of those with you now. Um, but the, the Helodermas is this venom, um, and again, they use it more for defending themselves than for attacking prey items. So these are the adorable horned lizards. Um, this is the same individual that I showed you a photo of at the very beginning of the talk. We were looking from his back over his head. Uh, and so this is a really cool group of lizards. Um, we have several species in California where they typically live in more dry habitats and they specialize on eating ants. And they have a really remarkable defensive strategy where they will shoot blood out of their eyes at would-be predators. Uh, and so obviously a video is necessary to demonstrate how cool this is. So this is a great video from National Geographic. So here you can see this is a pretty stocky, um, slow moving lizard. It eats ants exclusively. And so it has to spend a lot of time searching for food and it takes it a while to eat all those ants. So it's pretty vulnerable, vulnerable um, if predators come and uh, try to attack it. it. Doesn't really have the ability to run away and it's also exposed while it's out eating ants. But it has this special defense strategy where it has these little pockets around its eyes where it can collect blood, and then it will squirt that blood. This is probably dramatized, um, but it will squirt that blood at the predator, potential predator. And as you can see, it startles the potential predator who freaks out and hopefully runs away. And then the a horned lizard can go back to enjoying its ant meal. So another really cool group of lizards, the flying lizards in the genus Draco, have a very different body plan than the horned lizards. So they're very slender um, and they are more arboreal. So they spend time up in the trees and the canopy. And what they do to escape predators, they have these large flaps of skin that they can extend kind of like a flying squirrel to glide from one tree to the next or to safely drop down from the treetops to the forest floor. So again, a video demonstrates this pretty nicely. So as you can see, when the flaps are closed, it just looks like a normal lizard. Um, but then when they need to glide from one tree to the next, they spread out their flaps and can safely land um, pretty far. And they can also direct which direction uh, they're gonna glide in by angling their flaps. So pretty cool adaptation. Okay, um, so now we're gonna move on to turtles and tortoises. So again, back to these terms that we hear, but we don't always necessarily know exactly what groups they apply to. Um, so a tortoise refers to a specific kind of turtle. So again, kind of like toad refers to a specific kind of frog. Um, and technically the 
tortoises are in the family um, Testudinidae, and they are terrestrial, and they have these domed shells and these kind of stubby elephant tine feet, they're called. Um, so the species that I'm holding here is a tortoise, um, but then, and it's in, in that family, Testudinidae. But then there are other turtles that have that same kind of body plan. They're also terrestrial, they have a dome shell, um, but they're in different, they're in a different family. Um, so again, that's an example of convergent evolution where animals that live in similar habitats will evolve similar body plans to be able to live in those habitats. So the species on the right there is a box turtle. So there are only a few hundred species of turtles, but they occur in all different sorts of habitats, including freshwater, marine, desert, and they occur in temperate and tropical places as well. Um, and because of their unique body plans with lots of hard parts, they actually have a really extensive fossil record, including this very cool species from Australia, Ninjamies, um, that was named in honor of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So a very appropriate uh, scientific name for this very cool fossil tortoise or turtle. Okay, and last but not least, we have the crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and gharials. So this is the group of reptiles that is most closely related to birds or within reptiles, because birds are also reptiles. Um, and dinosaurs are extinct, so we don't count them uh, in, in this, but I guess technically, yes, dinosaurs are more closely related to birds than crocodiles are. Um, and so this close relationship, if you're, again, just looking at the uh, morphology and behavior of what we can see today, comparing uh, crocodiles and alligators to birds, it might be kind of surprising or unexpected to find that they are each other's closest living relatives. Um, but they actually share many skeletal traits with birds, and they also share some really interesting behavioral traits. Um, so one of those traits is providing parental care to their young, which um, all alligators and crocodiles do. And then they also have these really interesting courtship rituals. And um, so again, here's a video. This one has sound. Uh, and so what male alligators will do is they'll go into the water and they'll produce these sort of bellows and as they do that they're also vibrating the water droplets on their backsides and creating these really cool sort of fountain displays on their backsides to go along with this deep bellow and if you live in a place that has gators you might have been lucky enough to see this All right, and then of course, I can't talk about alligators without mentioning our resident alligator at the, uh, at the academy, Claude. So Claude uh, is enjoying his social distancing at the academy while we're temporarily closed. But as soon as you get a chance to come visit, I'm sure he will be more than happy to welcome you. Um, and that marks the end of Herpetology 101 officially. And if you want to learn more, some good references I can recommend are the BBC's Life in Cold Blood series. It has really amazing footage, including that um, marine iguana footage that I showed you from the Galapagos. And there's some really great books for different audiences. So this is one of my favorite books that I received recently. Um, and it's all about frogs, it has really amazing illustrations and also lots of really detailed and scientifically correct information. Um, this is a really fun book that is all about sort of amphibians and reptiles in culture um, throughout time. So in mythology and different superstitions, uh, which is a really fun book. And then if you want to learn more about the amphibians and reptiles that you can actually see, because that's the best part, um, I highly recommend getting a field guide for whichever region you live in. So this is the field guide of Western reptiles and amphibians, which covers California, um, where I live. And these books are great for 
looking at not only which species live near you, but also they often have really helpful tips for telling different species apart and uh, information about the behavior and reproduction and other interesting things that species you want to look for. And I highly recommend that you, uh, as soon as you're able to safely, get out into whatever nature you can find near you and search for some amphibians and reptiles. And hopefully you can do that this weekend as part of the City Nature Challenge. So um, that's it. And if there's any time for questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, hi, Raina. That was amazing. Thank you. You changed location. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> I did. I, uh, I'm having a little internet trouble, so I got closer to the router. So apologies in advance if I get glitchy. Um, right. But yeah, thank you. I feel like a better person now that I know pumpkin toadlets exist. Oh, they're so amazing. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, we do we do have questions, so I'll get into I'll get into them because there are quite a few. Um, Old guy, well, I'm not going to read the YouTube names on all these because it just is embarrassing for everyone. But the question is, why did some lizards devolve legs? Yeah, so that's a major area of research uh, in reptile biology. And there are sort of two different ways that people are approaching that question. Um, the first is trying to understand the genes or like the genetic part that's involved with losing limbs. And then, because it also seems to happen in kind of a stepwise process where you have a lot of species where the limbs are really reduced. Um, and so then you get to the point where you just have like a couple fingers sticking out or just like a vestigial part of the leg sticking out. Yeah. Um, and so trying to understand the genetic regulation of that process in different species. But then there's also the other side, which is what's the selective pressure from right. the ecology of the animal that makes that advantageous. And so that can be a little bit more challenging to assess, um, but people look at, or biologists study the um, locomotion or the movement abilities of different species on different substrates or different surfaces. So trying to see if it's more efficient to move through long grasses or on sandy surfaces or um, more uneven surfaces with or without legs. So they'll set up these sprinting trials or slithering trials on um, different surfaces and measure the performance of different animals on those surfaces. That's cool. I think I would like to see some slithering trials. Um, but speaking of research broadly, I realized the talk, which was so good, it also didn't get into really like your area of expertise and study. And I know that it's a big thing to describe in just a few sentences, but can you tell viewers like what your actual like area of research is? Cause it's so fascinating. Uh, yeah, so there are, I mostly study amphibians. I mostly study frogs. And a lot of my research is related to figuring out the relationships the evolutionary relationships among different species and the process that led to that divergence into two species or multiple species happening in the first place. Um, so sort of the first step is documenting diversity. So finding out how many species we have of these different organisms. And then we want to know their evolutionary relationships. Um, so basically a really zoomed in version of that tree that I was showing of the relationships among birds versus crocodiles, um, but at the species level. So how is this species of frog related to the other species of frog that live near it? Um, but then we also want to know how those species came to be in the first place. Um, and so sometimes that involves just looking at their genetic ancestry and um, trying to figure out when that divergence happened, which might we might then be able to tie it to certain global events, like changes in sea level or the emergence of a volcano and a mountain chain. Um, but then we're also interested in their physical characteristics and how they've adapted to the different environments that they look at. So that might include things like looking at their differences in um, body proportions or physiology. So like some species, have special adaptations for living in more dry habitats uh, versus more wet habitats. 
And then other things that might also affect um, the speciation process. So behavioral differences between species, especially behaviors that are related to mating mm -hmm. and courtship. So differences in coloration and call and other sort of signals that species use to tell each other apart and attract their mates. So you just, you want to know everything about frogs. I want to know everything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, I, you know, hard to condense into a yeah. talk like this. But I, yeah, I'd be happy to give a talk in the future that's a little bit more focused on what I actually study. Yeah. But I wanted to give people a broad sense of all the things that exist in the world of herpetology that they yeah. too could study. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, limit no, yourself. Yeah, I would love to have you back for sure. Um, okay, I'll, I'll crank through some more of these questions. Um, Ellie asked, and this is specific to the, early on in the talk you showed the um, frog whose eggs were deposited in the skin and then, okay. What was that called again? The Suriname toad, but it's oh, not toad. technically a toad. <laughs> right, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, well, Ellie asked um, what, basically what you mean when you say eggs are deposited in the skin. So does she lay the eggs and then they're deposited or do they start in the skin or how does that work? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So yeah, if people weren't so, creeped out by this I like maybe <laughs> would have tried to include a video of it because it's really neat but it the videos exist so Ellie I suggest you google this um, but basically the males and the females do this very elaborate sort of like somersaulting dance underwater and the female releases her eggs and the male fertilizes them and then he pushes them <laughs> into her back like into the skin and then skin grows over them. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, that's why, I mean, some people get yeah. a little weirded out. Um, and so then she carries them protected in her back until they're ready to emerge as little that's, frogs. That It's so, um, it's like, is that the most efficient way to do that? Like, it's so elaborate, but it's also like so genius, you know, like that's kind of amazing. Is yeah. there something about like where those frogs are in particular that makes that advantageous? Mm, you know, I'm not sure exactly why. So the one of the things that people are that herpetologists are studying with respect to all those sort of variations that I was showing, deviating from that like egg in the water, tadpole metamorphosis froglet, um, is yeah, what's the environmental difference that would select for all these different variations that we see? Yeah. And there are a bunch of different hypotheses. One hypothesis is keeping your developing eggs safe from predators. So eggs are very nutritious mm -hmm. and a lot of predators want to eat them. Um, and so if you're able to keep them safe, you, some species guard their eggs after they lay them on the ground. But of course, if a predator comes and it's much bigger than you, you might not have very much success mm -hmm. <laughs> in defending your nest. Um, so if you can carry them around on your back, Maybe you can keep them safe more effectively yeah. that way. Um, and then some species are also, it doesn't really apply in the case of the Suriname toad because it's aquatic, so its eggs are in the water anyway. Um, but if you're worried about your eggs drying out, then having either that special meringue nest or that mud mm -hmm. nest can help trap moisture so that they stay humid and they're able to complete development. So there's a variety of sort of environmental factors yeah. that might be relevant and then also predators and other species that um, are trying to get your eggs. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Matt asked, does a lizard that shoot blood out of its eyes have to recharge after, or is that loss of blood in any way significant? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, I actually, I have, presumably they can't do it again right away. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know how long it takes them to sort of recharge. and. From what I know, it's not very easy to induce them to shoot the blood. So mm -hmm. presumably it is a costly thing for, for right. them to do, and they're only going to do it if they really feel threatened. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll look and see if anyone's tried to quantify it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Linda's burning question is, do some species of frogs have different numbers of fingers? Yes. Okay. Um, including... so. In frog species that are very, very small, um, it's kind of like the lizard species that are losing their legs, or like mm -hmm. groups of lizards that are losing their legs. 
um, they start to lose structures of the limb. So really, really small frogs oh. have fewer numbers of fingers, including the pumpkin toadlet, your new favorite frog. <laughs> um, they just have three fingers. So they're like, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So they just, so they, they basically just, if you're that small, you kind of just don't need as many to. Yeah, or... it's unclear if it's, again, like from a genetic perspective, you can try to get at like what's happening in their genome to make it so that they're losing the number of fingers. Uh -huh. But from the selective advantage perspective, it's a little harder to get at. Um, and it could be that if you're that small, you just can't have four fingers right. <laughs> and be a vertebrate because, you know, they have to have bones inside. Right. So maybe there's just some like structural limitation yeah. to how many fingers you can have. Uh, presumably right. the cost of losing a finger is not as high as the benefit of being smaller. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy nature math. Um, Mike would like to know, how do scientists actually know the tuatara isn't a lizard? Okay, so yeah, so part of the naming process, uh, and lizard is kind of a tricky name because it it's like kind of like picking and choosing from different groups of the squamates. So like technically snakes are lizards, like they're in that big sort of umbrella term but when we talk about snakes we think of them as being a separate thing from mm -hmm. lizards so it's kind of like a semantic thing of how we're defining lizard but in terms of how the rancocephalia which is the tuatara group are distinct from the squamata which is the group that includes the lizards and snakes and amphisbenians um, there's a lot of evidence from their morphology so from their skull morphology and from the fossil record of other now extinct species of a lot of um, skull and other morphological differences, and then also from genetic data. So comparing the genetic sequence of the tuatara to uh, living species of lizards, there's very, very, very deep genetic divergence between them on the order of hundreds of millions of years. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay, I will ask you two more. One is a small one and one is a big one. The small one, which I think that we should just ask you to um, actually reenact re is oh, Sarah, would, Sarah would like to know how the mud nest is made. Oh, so, yeah. and that I actually don't know if there is a video of that that I could point you to. Um, but they build them usually like at the edge of a pond or like a body of water. So um, there's mud around and yeah, the male builds it um, in that species. And so he's just sort of like probably scooting around <laughs> and making lumps of mud. And then he gets inside and hopes that a female likes his nest and wants to put her eggs inside. Mm -hmm. So there's a, so, so there's like body movement, not like flipper or like hand. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. It's fine. I'm, I'm just trying to get you to do it again. To, yeah. I just wanted to see if I yeah. could. Yeah. Well, and there's different. So that's a really, um, like volcano-y shaped yeah. one with a very small opening. But there are ones that are more kind of like mud jacuzzis, <laughs> like more of like an open shape, yeah. <laughs> um, and they have a little bit of water in the bottom. Um, mm. But yeah, I, for those ones especially, I just kind of picture them kind of like moving their booty around to yeah. make a little depression in the mud. Cause their arms are not necessarily the most uh, <laughs> mobile yeah. for yeah, moving large piles of dirt or mud around. But yeah, I feel like there should be a, that's a, that's crying out for a video. Yeah, we can request that BBC film it for us. <laughs> okay, yeah, the warm-blooded, warm-hearted David Attenborough, yeah. please. Um, okay, last one for now. Um, from Julie, and she would, she's asking, are reptiles better built for long life than other species? Like the tuatara and the Galapagos tortoise just seem so extraordinary. Um, yeah, so that's also an active area of research. People are very interested in understanding the aging process. Um, and to some degree, I think that the slower metabolic rate is tied to being able to live longer. Um, and there are species of amphibian that are also pretty long-lived and they 
um, like that amphioma that I mentioned that can mm -hmm. live 25 years, which maybe doesn't seem super long. Um, but there are other species of salamander, like these cave salamanders that can live much longer than that, um, over 70 years, I think is the oh, estimate. Wow. Yeah. And they, one thing that they all seem to share is having a sort of slow and steady metabolic rate compared to things like, um, like mammals, like small mammals, which are really active and have to eat all the time and maintain mm -hmm. a really high body temperature. Mm -hmm. But yeah, aging is a very active area of research for sure. Okay. And reptiles do kind of represent some of the more extreme situations. So potentially they'll be helpful for getting some answers. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, we really would uh, like, yeah, for sure. Love to have you back to talk about your research. And uh, you didn't even mention the, um, that you have another whole separate project, right? About um, how vision works. In oh yeah. That's a whole uh, other, yeah. Which is related to uh, wanting to know how frogs can tell each other apart and whether or not coloration is important for doing yeah. that. So of course we need to know what the frogs are actually seeing, not just what colors we see when we look at frogs. Yeah, so we're gonna need to hear about that. So let's just put <laughs> okay. on the calendar. <laughs> Prepare. But, yeah, okay, well thank you again. And thank you to everybody who watched. Um, we have, you come back tomorrow, we're having um, a very special guest, Vicki McCluskey from Steinhardt Aquarium, cause it's World Penguin Day. So of course we're gonna live stream straight from our colony. Um, and then coming up in the days ahead, we'll have Dr. Jack Dumbacher, who's our curator of ornithology, uh, Meridius Bell, who's a dive safety officer who oversees all of our scientific diving programs um, that get our divers down to 500 feet or more, uh, Dr. Peter Rupnerine, curator of geology, and in the future again, Dr. Raina Bell coming back to tell us even more about her own actual research. So thank you again and um, have a great weekend. Take care, we'll see you at everybody else tomorrow. Thank you. Sounds good, bye everybody. Bye.